And so tonight, to our guest, uh, Tom Katina is the 2017 Aurora Laureate. This is the Aurora Prize for Awakening Humanity, which has been awarded now for four years and was established by several Armenian philanthropists in order to honor the survivors of the Armenian Genocide. There's a parallel between now and that time 100 years ago. And we offer the same gratitude to those saviors in the midst of tragedy, people who, like Tom, did something to help complete strangers to survive. They often, like Tom, did so at great risk to themselves. You want to talk about performing when everything's on the line. Later tonight, we'll talk about Alex Honnold, my favorite rock climber. They're performing under similar stakes, maybe even worse because there's multiple lives involved, right? So personally now, the reason I'm so interested in, in bringing Tom here is my, my gratitude, my graduate research focused on the study of gratitude, but we studied it in the context of the Holocaust. So in the midst of these deep, dark tragedies, such as what we'll discuss in the Sudan, um, you will still find those who are acting with deep, deep compassion and profound human dignity. So I spare a very special connection to Tom and his work. Um, from an academic side, when I was sourcing and looking through with Susanna all these stories and heart-wrenching testimony, to me this is just such an honor to bring that personified here, to bring the person who is making those stories come to life. So I, I want to share with you a brief video to highlight some of the work of uh, the Aurora um, Initiative, as well as introduce you to Tom and what he does um, in Africa. The thing that impresses me about the Nuba is their sense of independence and their feeling of pride. But we have a sense of dignity. We are humans. We're the equal to anybody else. I love that about them. started, this is June 2011, most of the humanitarian organizations, there, were, there weren't so many, but the ones that were here in the mountains, most of them left. Some of the hospital staff, the expatriate staff left. I stayed behind, Amoni's sister stayed behind, and the priest stayed behind. We all felt the same thing. We felt this is really the moment of need for the people here. All that time when I was the only doctor, I was responsible for all of the patient wards. So I was uh, the doctor doing the rounds and following the progress and, and taking care of them. The only thing that really helped was the staff really pulled together. When those things happen, you say, let me just, I'll do any other job in the world. Let me be an accountant, because books don't bleed, people don't die, you just do with numbers. And you just, your brain is just on fire. And then something brings you back. Whatever, some kid comes up and, or somebody that you didn't think would do well survives. You're like, come on, man, just, just grow up, just do your job, you gotta do it. Children give you life. That's a source of life. And just their, their attitude, their cheerfulness. Kids just want to be normal, they want to play. We have a kid and he's really is badly burned or badly wounded or whatever. And once he starts improving, wants to start playing with you and can joke with you, can tickle the kid, he tickle you back, he'll joke around with you. This just gives you energy to continue on with life. Excellent, well please join me in welcoming Dr. Tom Katina. Okay. Yes. Um, so, Tom, if you can just give us the primer on how we got to here. You know, where, 
did you grow up? What were some of the influences? And, and what's, the, what's the trajectory that took you to, to this moment and to your current career path? Uh, well, I covered a lot of years. <laughs> so yeah, um, I'm from upstate New York, uh, a small town called Amsterdam, New York. Um, very old Rust Belt kind of place, not much going on. Uh, really pretty boring, a pretty stable upbringing. Wonderful upbringing, but kind of boring. So growing up, I always wanted to kind of get out. You know, I was I felt constricted in this in this place. I always had this desire to travel and do things. We never went anywhere. You know, as a kid. Now uh, I go off. I went to college. I went to Brown University, which is in Rhode Island. And when I was there at Brown, I, I'm a lifelong Catholic, what, what you call a cradle Catholic. I had kind of a spiritual reawakening uh, in, during my college years, uh, mainly through Protestant uh, missionaries, Campus Crusade uh, people. And I thought, man, I'd really like to do mission work. I want to be a missionary, whatever that meant. I wasn't sure at the time, but I just wanted to do mission work. I wanted to work with, um, with, uh, with uh, people that were in poor countries, that were underdeveloped regions, uh, be of some service. That was kind of the overarching thought I had. I didn't know what form it would take, but the feeling was I needed to do mission work in the developing world. That was kind of the idea. The problem was I was studying mechanical engineering, which was not a good fit for doing this kind of work. You know, I was like, well, engineering, and this was in the 1980s. Uh, this was during the Reagan era, and they were, uh, there were a lot of jobs in defense industry which does not fit well with mission work. I mean, it's great for making uh, ballistic missiles and that kind of thing, but not for mission work. Anyway, I graduated college, was given a good job with GE and the nuclear power uh, division, and I thought, man, it'd be interesting work, but it's not really what I want to do. So then, um, just one day, the idea just popped in my head that I should go into medicine. That would be a good fit. I could do mission work, I could help people, I could, I could do my uh, sciences, which I really loved. And uh, that's what I ended up doing. So um, that was uh, 1986, I think, a long time ago. And I kind of followed that through. So it was just kind of a vague idea I had then. Uh, through uh, a year in Japan, a year of taking pre-med classes, medical school, uh, residency, time in the Navy to pay back for medical school. Now you fast forward to 2000. So 14 years after this initial thought that I wanted to do mission work and work in the, in, uh, in the underdeveloped countries. And I said, okay, you know, I'm finished with everything, finished my residency. Um, I'm kind of free to do what I want. I said, let me give this a shot. I want to go and, and do mission work. I want to go to a mission hospital uh, in Africa and see what it's like. So ended up in Kenya, in rural Kenya. My thinking was I would go for one year, see how it was, and if it really, you know, if I liked it, maybe stay for a couple of years. If I didn't like it, just come back and hang out my shingle and live a normal life. I had a girlfriend at the time, and she was uh, not very interested in doing this kind of work. She said, look, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to go to Kenya. I'll go for a year, and I might stay longer. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. She goes, all right, we'll see you later. That was the end of that relationship. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I went for went down there. Just arrived in Kenya at this rural place, and the the sister that was there, Sister Bridget, she was an older Irish nun, and she's like, "Okay, Tom, great, you're here. I heard you're coming for two years. That's wonderful." I thought, man, I thought I was just coming for a year, so I didn't want to disappoint her. So I just said, "Okay, I'll stay for two years." So I decided right there, I'll stay for two years and see how it goes. And then two became three, and four or five, and now it's been 19 years in Africa, uh, 11 years in Sudan. I mean. Um, the southern part of Republic of Sudan. Uh, Sudan, I don't know how familiar you guys are with it, but it's an area that's pretty much been in civil war since its inception in 1956. You got independence in 1956, and it's pretty much been uh, in civil war since that time. Uh, the most recent civil war in our area started in June 2011, and uh, that was almost eight years ago, and we're still at it. Uh, there's not been any much active fighting in the past couple of years, but still no peace agreement and we're still in a state of civil war. Um, yeah, a lot of uh, terrible things. I mean, there's always, I, I think we have this vision of war and that it's uh, some kind of a heroic venture and yeah, especially for a man, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a man, my father was a Marine, my brother went to West Point, I was a football player. This is kind of what we're made of, this is what we do. I was in the military and the Navy. When you're faced with it, when it's kind of in your face, you get a very different picture. Uh, I was a flight surgeon uh, in the Navy, and it's kind of a fancy word. You're basically a, a doctor. You treat colds for pilots, okay? That's what it is. It's not, it's not very interesting. And I used to love watching the jets take off. I was with the F-18 squadron. It's incredible. 
You watch the jets take off. I mean, they turn on the afterburners and take off, and they go vertical. I mean, they're incredible. Go watch the Blue Angels. I thought, man, this is so cool. It's a very different thing when you're on your on your belly, and there's a supersonic bomber overhead bombing you. <laughs> a very different uh, feel for for jets and the absolute destruction they can they can they can uh, bring on somebody. Uh, I remember thinking this is during this is a few years ago, and we were. Um, uh, they, one of the jets went over and started bombing, and we ran out to the foxhole and jumped in the foxhole. I'm down there with the other patients and staff and cowering, and I'm thinking to myself, what are these people doing? What are these, what, what are these pilots doing? Don't they know there are people down here? <laughs> you know, you become kind of irrational. Of course they know the people down there. That's what they're doing. They're not bombing trees. They want to kill us. So it was a very stark realization that this is real life, that... These guys, you know, had a briefing. I know what, what it's like in that world. You have a briefing in the morning. You have your mission that day. You will fly from this point to this point. This is your target. This is the mission today. You're going to go and bomb a hospital. These guys got up in the morning, had breakfast, maybe had some tea, got in their airplanes, and it took off to come in and kill people at this hospital. So it's, it's very much uh, in your face. And the first time you see a patient come in with have his head blown off or shot in the throat who's gurgling blood, you see the reality of what war is and how, how horrifying it is that people are doing this to each other. Uh, it's a very sobering moment. So. I remember in the, um, the, one of the most stark scenes in the, the documentary, which I really recommend folks to watch, um, it, it, you're, you're so measured and collected. And I, I want to talk about that down the line. But one of the things, one of the few hitches I saw was dealing with someone who'd, who'd lost his nose. It was one of the few hitches where I saw you just walk away just going like, there's no point to this. Yeah. Um, it, you know, in these times when there, there's so little meaning to be, you know, apparent, you know, how are you, how are you even thinking about concepts of, you know, justice or hope or, um, you know, how are you even thinking about something when it's just so brashly um, unnecessary? Right. You know, where, where does your mind go to find the, the, the purpose? Well, you know what then happens when you're faced with uh, not only these massive traumas that would come in, we'd have uh, trucks pulling with wounded, there'd be 100, 100 wounded coming in at once. And, you know, I had to triage myself and my, our clinical officers, which are like PAs and some nurses, we had to triage all these people, figure out what to do with them, take care of all their wounds. It's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, a mass casualty is five or more wounded. This was 100 at a go. And... You don't have time to think about bigger issues at that, at that time. You don't have time to think about these other things. What your, your adrenaline is just going full steam. And you're focusing fully on the job at hand. You have time to, to think, to get tired. You just keep going. You go and you go and you go until you get to the last patient. Mm -hmm. Then you have time to think and maybe reflect a bit afterwards. And I think, you know, for me, it all, always comes down to the individual, where you think, OK, this is crazy, and what is happening is nuts. But at the end of the day, there's an individual who's wounded, who's traumatized, that you need to take care of. So just do that. Yeah. You know, for this moment, I can't, you know, I can't do much at, at a bigger level. Let me focus on this one individual and do what I can for that person. Yeah. And you, you've <coughs> mentioned this in some of your interviews. There's, there's something about speaking about your focus on the individual, right? There's a, there's a certain amount of cynicism. Mm -hmm. How do you address when people who say, it's, it's, one, it's one person. Right. You know, I think one of the, hopefully one of the biggest things I can do, if I may allow this, is one of the biggest diseases is cynicism. It is such a corrosive force. And it's something that creeps up on you. You guys are, are young. You're, uh, I hope a bit, I, I, if you're not idealistic now, then you're really in trouble because you usually get cynical as you get older. Whatever you have in you now, don't lose that. Don't lose that ide idealism. People make fun of young people. They say, oh, they're so idealistic they haven't faced the real world. Don't lose it. Why? Why lose your idealism? Keep that spark in you that you can do something, all right? Yeah, every, the world is not perfect. We know that. But cynicism is a real corrosive disease. It has to be fought with all of your fiber. So as you do get older, and these things will naturally creep into your way of thinking, fight it with all of your being, okay? It doesn't have to be that way. And, you know, I think people take this macro view to some of these conflicts. They'll look at Africa in general or Sudan and say, what a hopeless case. It's a drop in the ocean. Uh, what can you do? These people are always fighting each other and this and that. Why can't they sort themselves out? It's totally different when you're there. 
when you're there working with them, you get to know them as individuals and you see them. You see the humanity in the individual. It's a totally different ball game. You know, I'm saying that because I, mean, I had the same thing before I went. I thought, oh, yeah, whatever, you know. But when you get there, it's, it's completely different that they're actually, they really are individuals with their own, uh, their own soul, their own way of thinking, their own dreams, what they want to do in life. You don't see it as this big mass of people that, are, that you, you can't do much. You can do a heck of a lot for that one person you're with. So don't ever think that you can't do something. If it comes down to one individual you've helped, that's everything. Don't worry about the big picture. That's a wonderful <laughs> example of that um, <laughs> without leading too much. Can you, can you describe a little bit about the, um, the village that's up the street, that's up the hill from the hospital for people dealing with leprosy and your work in there? Right. There's a scene that I found just so startling in that and I, want, I, I hope you can just paint a picture of it. So we're, we're um, the hospital is made out of stone from the local area. It's shaped kind of like a big U. And right, there's a small hill, and then up on top of the hill, we, we built what's called, we call TB, TB Village, uh, TB Leprosy Village. And that's where we put our TB Leprosy patients, just to have them in, in isolation. It's just next to the hospital. There's a small fence there, and you go in there. And it's great. People, the patients love it up there. Sometimes we have to bring them back to the main hospital when they're really in bad shape, and they're, they're, they're always dying to get back up there. Well, not dying. <laughs> they're hoping to get back there. They always choose my words properly. <laughs> Hope they're not dying. <laughs> but they're hoping to go back up because they like the spirit of camaraderie there. Anyway, we, we had this place built. Um, it's out of local brick, uh, kiln fired. And um, we have, I don't know, 80 or 90 patients up there. They all have either leprosy or TB. And uh, they stay for the full treatment. So tuberculosis is extremely common there. And we have all types of TB. I know it's not a medical talk. But anyway, we have TB and we, we keep them there for six months or eight months if it's a, if it's a recurrent TB or relapse or whatever. The leprosy patients stay for a full year. So we provide the drugs, um, other medical problems they have. They often have wounds in their hands and other things we take care of. And we provide food for them. The reason we went with this is um, we first opened the hospital. We're treating them as outpatients, meaning they would come, give them drugs, maybe hospitalize them for a couple of weeks and send them back home and say, okay, come back in a month, collect your drugs and go back home again. We found they were all defaulting from treatment, meaning they would never finish the course. So we were creating a, a public health disaster. You have partially treated TB patients, partially treated leprosy patients going back out to the villages, spreading disease. This is really terrible in public health uh, measures. So the only solution was to uh, admit them and keep them there full time, and it's worked really well. That's TB Leprosy Village. It's a great place. You know, a lot of kids up there, and there's a school. Uh, our sisters started a small school there for the kids that are there long term. Uh, they made little uniforms for them, and they, somebody donated some Legos, so the kids have Legos to play with. It's really kind of a fun place. And so you, you'll often go into that place, right? There are not a lot of people would be willing to go into a leprosy village. You know, what's it like to go in and, and be there with these people who are so, so roundly shunned? Right, so Anuba is not that much different than a lot of places where leprosy is still uh, seen as a curse. My, my wife's mother has leprosy, and we treated her some years ago, and we've we've amputated almost all of her fingers, so she's got tiny stubs on her hands. She still cultivates and grows a whole lot more food than we do uh, with that huge disability. Um, and you know, I think the, the idea for us is, although they're, they're here in a village, they're with the TB patients, we go up there and visit them and, and do rounds on them, just to try to normalize their situation. Um, I mean, the truth about leprosy is, if you touch somebody with leprosy, you can't, you can't get sick from that. It's got to be by prolonged contact with their, their respiratory droplets. Same way you get pneumonia and co even common colds, coughing in somebody's face, they can get sick. Leprosy has got to be prolonged contact with that person. So being with these people, touching them, petting my back, you know, joking around with them is a huge deal psychologically for them. That we're there, we're taking care of them, not, they're not being rejected by us as a staff or by the other patients. So I think as part of the rehabilitation, this is a huge deal. Leprosy is very common there. It's, I mean, it's got in, incredibly interesting roots. If you go back and read back in Leviticus about the, how it was, it was part of the Jewish laws, how they uh, dealt with people with leprosy. Uh, really uh, fascinating, uh, age-old uh, disease uh, still around with us. It, it is interesting so that the fact <laughs> of the social touch is so critical when you talk to um, in, in the aging population, the lack of physical touch and contact is a, is a mm -hmm. real problem. I think it's part of the, the, 
the reason people get sick and stay sick. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And there, even the neuroscience of it is actually pretty amazing because your receptors are actually tuned to receive touch from a body temperature, um, you know, skin to skin contact is like a specific type of nervous system response hmm. to touch. It's, and it, it triggers all those mu opioid um, activity, which is your, your body's, you know, pain relieving sensors. Hmm. Um, there's studies showing, anyway, I won't get into it, but. No, it's um, interesting, I'm enjoying this. <laughs> well, there, well, there are studies showing that people in pain when receiving a cared, uh, an affectionate touch from a loved one, their rating of the pain drops immediately, even hmm. though the pain itself is the same. Hmm. Um, so it's 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 all one it's all one circuit. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the I want to talk a little bit about your your day to day approach. So when we watch the the video, you're there performing surgeries on people. How how much of you had to extend your you know surgical knowledge <coughs> just just on the fly there? You know, in terms of, I don't know what to call it improv, yeah. so to speak. But well, how have, how have you done that? Uh, well, a fair bit. I'm, I'm um, if you know the medical the way things are set up. I, I trained in family practice. I didn't train in surgery in the US. So almost all of my surgical stuff I learned on the job. Not, not on the fly, I would say on the job, meaning I had a, a surgeon when I was in Kenya, uh, very patient surgeons, some American missionary doctors and some Kenyan surgeons that I worked with and they were patient enough to teach me a lot of procedures. So by the time I got to Sudan, uh, I was pretty, I, I, I knew a pretty good repertoire of, of operations and felt pretty comfortable doing them. Having said that, there's a whole lot of stuff you have to do on the fly, and there's just no other way around it. We are the only surgical hospital. So if a patient comes to you and needs an operation, you cannot refer that patient somewhere else. You can't get somebody else to come and help you, you know? So it's, it's a very, it's an extremely uncomfortable feeling. It's very disquieting. But, uh, you know, I, the way I see it is, it, you know, this is, our, this is their chance, and we've got to do the best we can to take care of them. So, you know, it's uh, although it's very unnerving, um, if you get to do it and do it well, and the person makes it through, it's an incredibly satisfying experience. I, I wouldn't, I don't relish that feeling. It's, it's not nice, but I see it as my responsibility to do everything I can to get a good outcome for this patient. So, I mean, it's a lot of reading. Um, it's a lot of just getting extra information, uh, trying to figure out how to do the case, preparation, thinking things through, and then trying to minimize the risk that we do with the case. But there's just no other option. So I think when you're faced with that. Uh, is actually you can do a lot more than you thought was was possible. I mean, of course, I always it's always a risk benefit thing. So when you see a certain case, you say, "Look, if, I'm pretty sure if I do this case, I'll kill the patient. I won't do it. <laughs> I'm not I'm not there to to do funny business on people. But if I think, look, I've got a reasonable chance, or we have a reasonable chance of getting a decent outcome for this patient. I think they'll be better uh, better off doing the operation than not. Then we'll we'll go ahead and and, and do the operation. Is there a special, you know, you know, routine to your day that helps you trigger the, you know, the framework to have the confidence to do that? Because it, it seems like the confidence to do that is actually coming um, kind of before the ability, the locked in ability to actually do it. Right. So what is the, what is the mental framework? Uh, do you have routines or specific habits to, to put you in the place where you can handle that kind of pressure? That's in, that's incredible pressure. Yeah. I, I hope people can connect with that because if you think about it, lives are on the line. You've got to do something you've never really done before. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I hope I hope you don't get the impression I'm, I'm being cavalier. About no, this no. Stuff. I mean, there's all the preparation. Right. And you have weeks yeah. to pre-op and all that. But there literally that, is but. no other option where we have to yeah. do some of these things. And um, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm a creature of habit. So I, um, I get up every day at the same time around 5.30 um, and I, I go to church every morning. Thank God we have a priest there that's willing to come and offer mass every day. So I get up and my wife and I walk to church. We say the rosary on the way to the church, get there around six in the morning, about half an hour of quiet prayer. The mass starts from 6.30 to seven. And that's, that's the time to kind of get centered, I think is the word that people use but kind of get myself in a frame that I've got a big day, a big challenging, a lot of difficult things ahead of me. Put, try to put God first and say, okay, God, I'm here to do your work. Help me out, you know? Um, I need help. I'm not uh, I'm very limited in my abilities. And I recognize that. I think recognizing your, your, ability, your limits is, is, is a big thing and is a big part of ex accepting things and, and doing your best. Recognize where your limits are and say, okay, God, help me out. I need your help with this. Not that I'm, again, being cavalier and saying, oh, God will take care of it. If a person has massive bleeding, I'll just sit back. But I think I, I, 
for me, I, I need that to start the day off. Then I like to have some order uh, when I get there and start the work, what can we do rounds? Because once you get there and you start, it's, it's one thing after another. You start the rounds and somebody comes in who's bleeding or somebody needs a C-section or somebody comes in who's got their leg blown off and things get really disrupted and you start and you just dive into it. Yeah. But I think for me, starting that day and always keeping this in mind helps me get through the day, especially when things get really difficult. It's, it's definitely a near universal trait of high performers. If it's an athlete, um, or you know, an outdoors person, they'll always have a morning, especially entrepreneurs and business people, especially them, will always have a morning routine. Um, and I, you know, I come at things from less of a faith angle, but it's the same routine of mm -hmm. getting a mind that's a blank slate that's ready and open to, to go crank. You know, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's pretty much, and what I, what I want to point out with that too fine a point is that I'm drawing the parallel between the finest, highest performers we talk and Tom's framework. Because they're, they're gonna be the same, I think. For the, that's my hypothesis, if you mm -hmm. don't mind. But, yeah. um, so how many, how many days a week do you work? Well, every day, I mean, there's no days off. So it's I mean, seven days a week. How um, many days a year then? Uh, 365 and a half. Yeah, I guess. yeah there you have it. <laughs> I mean, obviously Christmas day, <laughs> we just go and do rounds, but that's not, you know, it might be a couple hours and then yeah. I'm gonna call the, call the rest of the day, so I've gotta be available if something comes in. So there is not really a day or a night off. You know, yeah. It's just how it is when I'm there. You gotta be fully engaged. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's not easy. And how do you handle the, the, you know, is burnout a factor? I mean, how do you handle the need to constantly be, you know, running at full steam? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a challenge. I, I think for me, I, I see it as a sense, uh, out of a sense of service, that I'm doing it, so I've got a, sort of, uh, a sense of purpose uh, with what I'm doing. I see the, the, the strength and the will of the people. That's a, that's a big source of encouragement. You know, I think one of the, um, I was doing some reading about burnout, it was the last month, in terms of doctors, and the article I was reading said that 75% of doctors were experiencing some form of burnout in the US. 75%, that's unbelievable. And, some of the, they listed a couple of things. One was, um, I think they were talking about, uh, one article was talking about primary care doctors and they were saying the lack of variety, like doctors that had more variety in their practice had lower uh, chances of burnout because their mind was more engaged and they were doing different things. So my job is, is, is the most varied thing <laughs> in medicine I think you could probably possibly imagine. You go from gynecology to neonatal medicine to geriatrics to orthopedics and literally in the course of a day. and. It's very, it's, 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 it doesn't make you burnout proof, but it's harder because your mind is always engaged, always thinking, always challenged to do something different. Um, the second thing um, is, uh, the other, other reason for burnout, so often mentioned is uh, administrative tasks, things outside of your field that you're forced to do. So, you know, you're, you're, you're a medical person, I think everybody can do this with their job, whatever it is, you're kind of trained and kind of excited to do one thing. For me, doctors, we like taking care of sick people, that's what we do. Now a lot of uh, docs in America are saddled with administrative tasks, insurance forms. In front of me, there's a guy that comes to see me in Nuba, he's a family practice doctor, and uh, he's out in Boulder, uh, no, what's the other place there, the ski place there in Colorado. So he kind of sees sprained ankles and colds. And he sees 20 patients a day, and that'll take his entire day, you know, from, I don't know, 8 in the morning. He's busy like 8 or 8 o'clock at night by the time he finishes the paperwork. And, you know, we'll, we'll get through three or 400 in that same time period. And he says, man, you know, your job is so much more interesting than mine. I saw, <laughs> I'll see 20 patients, and there's not a single sick person. It's kind of boring stuff, and he's doing a lot of paperwork. So that, I think that leads to a lot of burnout. Um, so I think the job helps a lot, um, and despite, it's not so much the workload, um, it's the, 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 the type of work you're doing, I think, is, is one of the things that, that's, I think, helped. Yeah, that's so important, is that the story, <laughs> the personal narrative that you've crafted through this, both yeah. rooted in the need to serve people fully and completely, combined with just the general chaos of, of <laughs> a pretty hectic sounding yeah. schedule, mm -hmm. make a big difference. Yeah. So. I wanted to have a five to eight minutes for the students to be able to ask questions before we um, close with a final thought. Yeah. I want to ask, how would, like, let's say one surgery doesn't go well, mm -hmm. like, you know what I'm saying. Yep. <laughs> how do you, like, clear your mind for, like, the next mm -hmm. one? Because you probably have one, like, right after that, yep. too. So, like, what's your, like, mindset? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a good question. So as it couldn't hear his question is, if you have a bad uh, outcome in an operation or you have a, a bad outcome on the ward or, you know, something, I mean, this, this stuff happens all the time, something really upsetting happens. How do you, how do you, how do you get yourself together to see the next patient? Because, you know, it's not like you have a bad outcome and you can take the day off and kind of say, look, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm too traumatized, I'm, I'll see you back in a week. I, you don't have that luxury. So I think for me, what I try to do, and it's, it's, that's one of the hardest parts of the job, probably the hardest part is exactly what you said. You're doing rounds in the morning and a kid you thought was doing fine just dies in front of you, you know? Or an operation that you thought went great, you go to see them the next morning and things are turning sour and you're totally stressed out about this thing. And yet people are lined up behind this guy that need, that need your attention. And if you're, if you're totally preoccupied with this thing that's gone wrong, you're doing a disservice to all those people that need your help. So the only way I've, I have found it to, to take care of that problem is, again, to come back to this faith aspect. In the end, I'm not the author of life and death, that I'm there to try to do my best to take care of people, one person at a time. And if I'm doing my best and all I can and there's a bad outcome, I just have to accept that. Uh, that bad things happen and you know, God in the end is in, is in charge of life and death and I've got to get over that and just move on to the next person. Um, and I'm saying that here, it's easy for me to say here, it's extremely difficult uh, to do that. So um, probably the hardest part of the job is what you just, what you just said. That's a lesson for any, any job for self-care and self-forgiveness. Yeah, yeah. self-forgiveness, yeah, exactly, that's it there. Also, you have to forgive yourself and say, look, we're all, we're all mortal, I'm, I'm not God. So, you know, when you start, if you get too caught up in yourself and expecting perfect outcomes, then what's that say about yourself? That, you know, is that saying I'm God and I have control over all these situations? I don't. So some of that is humility to accept your limitations and to move on. We saw a question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. First, I want to thank you so much for coming. Um, it's amazing having you here. Um, thank you. My question is, in your documentary, you mentioned how it was very difficult at first coming to this village of people and they didn't know who you were. And, um, being able to gain their trust to treat them was like a challenge. So my question is, what um, was there a specific moment that you could point out where you realized that they did start to trust you and how did that change um, your practice there? Yeah, it's... Um, to get the trust, you know, the, the, we, we, it was a big shock to us when we got there, and the people didn't uh, didn't trust us. The people were not too bad, but a lot of the the local government officials and the health health officials they were weren't really trained people, but they like despised us. Like, what the heck, man? What, what's wrong? What did I do? You go to the to start a hospital, and these people don't don't even like you. So and I, I realized this is due to centuries of being traumatized by outsiders. So that can accept you coming in here. You know, imagine somebody shows up from, from Mars and says, I got this great way to treat you. Are we going to trust this, these people? So it, it takes, I realize it's just going to take time. So we said, look, let's just be patient, not react, and just kind of do our thing. And it was very stressful because we thought these people don't trust us already. Now, what if we start having bad outcomes, getting back to your point? What if things go wrong? Even things you have no control over. They'll say, see, these people are here to kill us. You know, they're, they're untrustworthy. I mean, thank God things went okay. There were a few points when we realized that, the, that we were gaining the trust. One, one of the first episodes was the local, what's called the Pyme Administrator, which is kind of a local government official, local mayor. He was really against us, you know, just despised us. He, had like, he has like three wives. And one of his wives was there. We did a certain procedure on her um, that can lead to heavy bleeding. Um, so uh, we did the procedure in the morning. She was doing fine. I checked out, okay, everything's fine. I go back in the evening to do the round. It was about 6 o'clock in the evening. And I'm going by her bed, just kind of like checking on people. And I see her lying in bed in a pool of blood. I mean, she could swim through the thing, just, just gushing blood, push on the abdomen, and just blood comes flying out, you know. So she had a, a complication which we recognized, um, and we had to get massive, you treat with massive blood transfusion. We go running around, and it's people that do not want to give blood. So we had, I talked to her brother-in-law. He would not give blood for her. So we managed to get a couple people, and I think on the staff gave blood. I went and gave some blood, and she survived, you know. And, you know, when the husband who was against us heard about it, he kind of started warming up a bit towards us. The local health guy, similar thing where he had many of his relatives and kids and everybody else came to the hospital for treatment. They had good outcomes. He started warming up a bit. The big difference was when the war started, 
So we've been in, now when the fighting started, we've been there three, three years and a couple months. And fighting started, a lot of these uh, people left, NGOs left, our, most of our expatriates that worked at the hospital left. And we stayed, myself and the sisters stayed there and kept uh, doing, uh, carrying on with the work. And I think that's, for them, that was the moment where they said, okay, these people are legitimate, we can trust them. Uh, and it really bought us a lot of credibility with the people there. Somebody who I think has found the kind of purpose that I think everybody wants mm -hmm. and most people never get. Mm -hmm. So would you talk for a second about not so much, I'm sure your professional decisions are related to this, but not so much about the professional decisions you've made in your professional path, um, but uh, more of your the personal decisions, mm -hmm. your personal philosophy. We've heard a lot about your faith. Just your outlook on life that, that has led you to, to the kind of existence that I think everybody would want, would want to have at some point. Mm -hmm. that's, 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 what I, that's, that's what I really want to about you. Yeah, um, yeah, good question. You know, I think maybe a couple of things that, that come to mind. You know, I think really uh, one thing is recognize that uh, life is hard. And it took me years to, re to, re to realize that life is hard. And I think when you grow up in the U.S., I mean, I'm not any different than you guys. I went to, you know, a great family and great university and education. You kind of get this feeling that life, you know, is supposed to be great all the time. You know, you're kind of floating through and, you know, if, you're, if your coffee turns cold, it's like it's a big problem. But I think if you realize, just recognize that life is hard. That's the first thing. Don't, and if, it, if it's hard, don't worry about it. That's how it is. It's just, you know, life's freaking hard. Don't worry about it. Um, and don't always expect perfection. Oh, expect things to go wrong. Uh, expect difficulties. And don't be surprised when they come along. Be prepared, okay, things are gonna be crappy. Okay, I can handle this. I expected it, it's here, let me just deal with it. Let me do the best I can. <coughs> I think in terms of, of, of happiness, or um, if not happiness, maybe joy or kind of inner peace. Um, you know, I, I, I don't wanna sound like I'm some kind of guru, uh, but I think for sure, if you really dedicate yourself to a life of service, when your focus is always outward instead of inward, that's a big step. Um, you know, a lot of uh, depression, certain, certainly neuroses, and maybe I think Len probably knows more about this than I do, psychological neuroses and, uh, are often inward, uh, turning anger and things inward, focusing on yourself and your own issues, your own problems. And it's very easy to do that in our society, in the U.S. society. And other societies, people say, oh, I went to Africa, people are so poor, but they're so happy, blah, blah. They can't focus on themselves. They're too, tight, they're too caught up with survival and kind of daily things they have to do all the time. Their focus is more outward. And if you try to cultivate that attitude of always looking outward, what can I do to service and help somebody else as opposed to what's in it for me? Always think of that. What can I do to help somebody else? You don't have to come to Sudan and be a medical doctor there. All you guys have the ability to do that. We've got problems here in the U.S. Focus on, on something or someone else, no matter what it is. And I think that's up for, for the individual to think through what that is, because it's going to be different for everybody. Um, the other thing is, uh, another quick point is in terms of uh, material possessions, just kind of brass tax things. Divest yourself. I mean, if I can advise you on something, get rid of your crap. <laughs> Un unburden yourself from expectations, from material goods, um, uh, too, many, too many commitments that are not necessary for making you happy. Um, you know, I'll tell you, I went to uh, 
I went to a Super Bowl party on Sunday to this place, and um, it was unbelievable. I mean, this house was, I've never seen anything like it. There were, you know, flat screen TVs all over, and there were 200 guests and food everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was great. It was fun and incredible. We went down, and the guy has this, like, an antique car collection. And, like, one of those cars could have funded our, we could have run the hospital for five years for the cost of one of those cars. And I'm not saying that, you know, when you grow up, you're going to have this collection, but and I'm, not, I'm not even pointing a finger at this guy. I, I really, I don't, it doesn't bother me. Like, he, he lives his life. That's his life to live. But I think for a lot of people, that makes them, all that does is makes them more miserable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I've found, I just, I've been, um, this is my first time back in the U.S. for more than three years. Mm -hmm. Last time I was out, uh, I've been to Armenia twice, but that was very quick trips for the Aurora Prize. I was in, in the U.S. last, a little more than three years ago. And that was for five days. It was around Thanksgiving time in 2015, and I was sick the whole time with malaria. So I wasn't really fully out. I was just miserable the whole time with this, with this sickness. But the, the changes that I've noticed from a few years ago and now are very stark. So I am kind of a Martian. I've been out of the loop for a few years. I'm kind of in a time capsule coming back. Things are different. These, uh, I got this phone in my pocket here. You know, I'm telling you, man, unleash yourself from that thing. Come to Numa Mountains, you cannot, there's no phone coverage. It's great. I can't wait to get back there, and there's no phone. I found myself going flipping through the Facebook and Twitter, and I'm like getting addicted. I started feeling nauseated and like stressed. And all these, uh, I'm reading all these things, people yelling at each other back and forth. I'm like, why am I doing this to myself? So I went, call, I'm not doing this anymore. Unleash yourself from, from this stuff. And I'm not saying that as a criticism, say, oh, you young generation, do it for yourself. <laughs> You know, try to unchain yourself and, and minimize that stuff. Get a book, read, really understand, try to understand people you strongly disagree with. Uh, think about where they're coming from. And, you know, I know the word Trump is an evil word, but even Trump or Trump supporters, try to understand where they're coming from. You know, is, just don't, don't be vicious in your attacks. Really try to think, what's, why are these guys thinking this way? What's it all about? I mean, from, you know, if you are a Trump supporter, think where the other side is coming from. And the, the vindictiveness and stuff, don't, don't let that enter in, don't let that creep, don't let that anger uh, or hatred creep into your life. This, you know? wow. Um, okay, so we have you for like five more hours. That's okay, right? Yeah. Silva, that's okay. Um, so, I mean, it was amazing. We, you've inspired a room, you've inspired me to not be cynical, to focus on that, accept that life is difficult, to scale up and seek, seek outward. Um, We'll send around resources so people can, can follow you and support you. Um, and um, this, has been, this has been a delight. And thank you so much. Huge round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. We did great. Yeah, we did great.